Good morning. How is everyone? Good. God is good all the time. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. I forgot that part. I'd like to ask how many of you were not here last night? Okay. Thank you. So later we're going to do some brief review of what we studied last night. Before we begin, I'd like to just share very briefly my own personal testimony. I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior in 1976 at a Billy Graham crusade in San Diego, California. After that, I began to go to church and I did my best to be a good Christian. But a year later in 1977, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was a very powerful experience for me because I began to feel the love and presence of God personally, intimately, in a way which just, just broke my heart. You know, the love of God was so sweet, so wonderful. And so immediately, almost, I was transformed. I just had to tell people about Jesus, about how much he loved them, about what he did for them. Now, I am an Asian, and by nature, Asians are very conservative, quiet, low-key. We don't rock the boat. We want to assimilate, okay? But after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I became so bold. I became a street preacher. I, I went out and bought this powerful bullhorn with eight size D batteries, and I would go around the streets blowing people away with the love of God. Jesus loves you. Repent. Okay? Can you imagine an Asian doing that? It's, it's, it's obviously the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? This, this boldness. And eventually, I felt maybe God has a different calling for me. And I said, I, I want to tell people about Jesus. I want to tell people who never heard about Jesus. And so I felt, I'm going to go and be a missionary. I'm going to go to places where there's no churches. You know, in North America, so many churches, you know, and so many so-called Christians, you know. I want to go to a place where the gospel has never been preached. And so I took my wife to Indonesia. We ended up in the jungles. When we went, we exercised radical faith. We had no support from any church. Typically, missionaries have to raise funds so that when they go to the mission field, they don't die of starvation, all right? And they have to go from church to church to church to church, send out all kinds of letters asking for support, monthly support. I didn't want to do that. Being Asian, I had lots of pride, and I also wanted to trust God. I said, God, if you want us to go, you will provide. I don't need man's help. And so I said, God, if you want me to go, you will provide. When we went, and God provided miraculously, even though I didn't ask for any funds. And before we went, we did not join any mission agency. Typically, when someone wants to be a missionary, you have to join a mission agency. And this mission agency, they will prepare you, they will teach you, they will open doors for you. I don't want any help. God can open the doors for me. With God, all things are possible, okay? I had this radical, radical faith after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I believe that's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes us bold, and he makes us radical. He gives us great faith. All the doubt disappears. So we went to Indonesia. We had no invitation from any church or organization in Indonesia. We went there by faith in God, now, uh, other people have done this, and it doesn't always turn out nicely. I don't necessarily recommend that you do this, okay? But God was so gracious to us, he opened the door for us. We went into unreached areas, very primitive places, and we stayed there for nine years. We would go into villages, we would tell them about Jesus, we would heal the sick miraculously, and people would believe in Jesus because their idols had never done such miracles for them. So the Lord blessed us over nine years. We saw churches planted and people discipled. After nine years, the Indonesian government kicked us out, and we were forced to return to the United States. But that was our foundation. That's where we learned these things. And what was the context of these things? Proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard. All right? 
So what I'm teaching you is not healing for believers in church. No, 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 no. Uh, what I'm teaching you is healing to reach the lost. And when you're ministering healing to the lost, it can be very different from ministering to sick believers in church. The principles can be different. All right? All right. So my wife and I have been in full-time ministry for 40 years. We've been married, oh goodness, in, uh, on June 1st, we will have been married for 44 years. <laughs> and the Lord has truly, truly blessed us in every way. Except we are not materially rich, but in every way, He has blessed us. In terms of health, ministry, children, He has blessed us. Because in the beginning, we gave up our Isaac to Him. And what was our Isaac? Remember, Abraham was willing to give up Isaac to God. Isaac was Abraham's most treasured possession on earth. Abraham loved Isaac more than he loved his own life because he was the son born of a promise. We gave up the American dream. We gave up everything, all of our possessions, and we went to Indonesia to preach the gospel. And I believe because of that, today, the Lord has blessed us greatly, greatly. And so, you cannot outgive God. Amen. All right. And now my job is to give away what God has taught us these past 40 years. Freely you have received, freely you give. Now, this is my email, my personal email, Elijah003 at gmail.com. I'm giving it to you because... I want to give you this PowerPoint presentation for free because I want you to use it for review because I'm giving you a lot of material, much of which you have never heard before, and you need to look at it again and again and again and again. So please send me an email and request this PowerPoint presentation. I have been teaching this particular thing for the last 18 years, since the year 2000. And I have discovered some things. I have seen that typically one exposure to this training is really not enough for you to take off because there's so much material and you have to have such great faith to do these things like going out to the, uh, to the West Edmonton Mall with a sign saying free miraculous healing. Does it take boldness to do that? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And so you need that kind of boldness and faith and sometimes it may take more than one exposure to this training to get that kind of faith. I have seen that people who have sat through the training maybe twice or even three times, after the third time, they take off and a new ministry is born. Okay? We have seen several servants of God do that. After the third time, they take off. One of them is Carl Henderson. After the third time, he took off and he joined you and then you took him to even greater heights. <laughs> okay? So um, I would encourage you at least to get hold of this PowerPoint. And also, I believe this training is being videotaped. I believe Colin is going to put it on YouTube, he told me. Go back. Go to YouTube and look at it again and again and again. And as you receive the word of Christ, your faith will grow and grow and grow to the point where you're going to take off like Carl Henderson did. Okay. All right. Let me, let me do some review for those who were not here last night. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, that is the gospel which we preach, of course. And then in verse 11, Jesus said, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Believe what I say, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Jesus said, if you don't believe what I say, that I am the Messiah, the Son of God, but at least believe I am the Messiah on the evidence of the miraculous works that I have been doing. And the miraculous works that he did were the proof, the evidence that he was in fact sent by the one true God who created the heavens and the earth. Because no other God can raise the dead, can open the eyes of the blind. Only the one true God can do such miracles. And when Jesus did those miracles, he was proving that he was in fact sent by God. He was the Messiah. 
verse 12, And very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will even do greater works because I am going to the Father. Verse 12 says that you, believers, will do the works that Jesus did, the miraculous works that Jesus did as evidence that he is the Messiah, the coming King. Okay, that is the basis of this training. You are going to be trained to do the miraculous works that Jesus did as evidence to those outside the church that Jesus is the Son of God and that they must repent and believe on him for eternal life. Okay, that is the purpose of this training. Now, let's look at how Jesus healed the sick. Jesus said believers will do the works that he did. All right, let's look at how he did his miraculous works. Let's look at one instance where Jesus healed a leper. Luke 5, verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. All right, let's see how Jesus healed this man. Verse 13, Jesus reached out and touched the man. Uh, often Jesus would lay hands on the sick. And when he laid hands on the sick, healing power would flow from Jesus into the sick person through the physical contact. Jesus would heal the sick using power through the laying on of hands. And then Jesus said, I am willing, he said, be clean. Then he issues a command to the leper. He commands him to be clean. Now there, Jesus is exercising authority. The Father gave Jesus authority over infirmities. Authority is exercised by giving commands to that which is under your authority. So here we, Jesus, we see Jesus exercising authority over this leprosy by commanding the man or the leprosy to be clean. So here we see Jesus did what he often did. He used power and authority to heal the sick. When he laid hands on the sick, power flowed into the leper. And then when he commanded the leper to be clean, the leprosy obeyed and left. So this is typical of how Jesus healed the sick. Typical of how Jesus did his miraculous works. He would use authority and power. Now, let's see what Jesus did for his disciples. Let's see what Jesus gave to the twelve. Luke 9, verse 1, when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them this power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. So the power which Jesus used, the power and authority which Jesus used to heal the sick, now he gave it, he delegated it to the twelve disciples. Verse 2, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God, and to heal the sick. The purpose of Jesus giving this power and authority to the twelve disciples was so that they could be sent out and proclaim the kingdom of God to the lost and to heal the sick. They were to heal the sick using this supernatural power and authority. The miracles would be the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. And so they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. So the 12 disciples, they obeyed what Jesus commanded them to do after he gave them this power and authority. They, they went out, village to village, preaching the gospel and people everywhere using this very supernatural power and authority. Notice they were not praying for the sick everywhere. No, they were not praying for the sick. They were healing the sick by using this power and authority, by laying hands on the sick and then commanding them to be healed. And so what we are learning to do is precisely how to use this power and authority to heal the sick as evidence to the lost that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. Now, let me continue where I left off yesterday. All right. Yesterday, I left off uh, as I was sharing what was happening in India. Do you remember last night 
I share to you a report that I received from a worker in India named Subhat Jena, where he went into an unreached Hindu village and he preached the gospel, he healed the sick, and 600 people in that Hindu village accepted Jesus. Remember that? Okay. Now, Subhat is now training 72 disciples to do what he is doing, all right? He's multiplying himself. What he's doing is every two months, he is taking a new batch of 12 disciples, and he's training them just like Jesus trained his disciples. How did Jesus train the 12 disciples? Well, he would take them with him wherever he went. Jesus would go from village to village, place to place, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons. That's how Jesus trained the 12. And that's what Subot is doing in Orissa today. Over a period of two months, he takes a batch of 12 disciples from place to place where he shows them how to preach the gospel, how to heal the sick, how to cast out demons. And he is doing this now every two months. He is raising up a new batch of 12 disciples. Those 12 whom have already been trained over a period of two months, he sends them out. Go, go, go. He sends them out to a completely unreached area where they are going to preach the gospel and heal the sick and plant churches and where they are going to multiply themselves. The process will be repeated again and again and again. All right? And so this year, see, we have 12 months this year, of course, as we do in every year, which means that he is going to be raising up six batches of disciples. Six times 12 is 72. So this year, we're going to have 72 workers that we are going to send out to the harvest field. Okay? That's what we do. You see, no one wants to go to these villages. People who go to India, they want to go to the cities, all right? Because that's where the people are. That's where the big churches are. Everyone wants to go to the cities. And that's where the offerings are, too. I hate to mention that, but that's reality, all right? No one wants to go to these unreached villages. There's no money there. There's nothing there. And so I have this burden to send workers into the Lord's harvest field where no one else wants to go. I'm talking about villages. Right now in India, the majority of the population still lives outside the cities and urban areas. They still live in the villages, the majority of the population of India. And so if we want to fulfill the Great Commission, we can't just go to the cities. We have to train workers and send them to the unreached regions of India. And that's what we are doing. We are supporting them. We are sending them out. And you know, it is very inexpensive to support one full-time worker. You know how much it costs? 75 US dollars to support an entire worker in his family for an entire month. Cheap, cheap, cheap. You know how much it costs to send a Western missionary each month? Five, 6,000 US, all right? But over there, $75 a month for a whole family. Do you think they can do a better job than a, than a Western missionary who doesn't know the language and doesn't know the culture? They can do a much better job. And they don't mind living in those villages because that's where they're from. Okay? Now, let me share with you uh, how Subot trained a group of 12 disciples. This is what he did, all right? He said, we divided up into three groups, three groups from the 12 disciples he was training. One group was especially fruitful. We started ministering in a particular house. People began to come one after another to be healed. <laughs> Within 20 minutes, the majority of the villagers had gathered in that house, around 90 people. Many sick people were healed as we laid hands on them in Jesus' name. See, things like this happen in villages. They probably won't happen in Canada or America. No, but they will happen in villages and places like India. When they hear about miracles taking place, people come and gather in that house. And they bring other sick people to be healed. It sounds like the Gospels, doesn't it? <laughs> I seize the opportunity, this is Subot Jenna speaking, to share the Gospel with the villagers. Okay? Why did the villagers come? Was it to hear the Gospel? No, it was to be healed. You get it? 
That's why Jesus says, heal the sick who are there, and then tell them the kingdom of God is near you. The healings draw the people to you. So I seized the opportunity to share the gospel with the villagers. They acknowledged that they had never heard such a thing and had never witnessed such miracles. I asked how many wanted to know more about the Lord Jesus and accept him. To our surprise, just about all of them raised their hands to accept Christ. This is what is happening in India in unreached villages. What is Subot doing? He is simply obeying Luke 10 verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Just obey. Just obey. Heal the sick first. It was another awesome experience with our Elijah Challenge disciples. Now, after these 12 disciples are properly trained, each of them will be sent to an unreached region where they will now heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God according to Luke 10 verse 9. They're just going to do the same thing. Each trained disciple will in the same way reach seven new villages in his assigned region. Subot will then repeat this training after two months with a new batch of 12 disciples and so on and on and on. A new batch of 12 disciples every two months is being trained and sent out. Eventually, these disciples will in turn train still other disciples in the same way, and so on and on and on, leading to an exponential increase in the number of workers, and therefore in the end time harvest as well. This is what we need to do. We believe we're in the last days, the time is short, but there are still billions who have never heard the gospel even once. That means that there must be an acceleration in missions during these last days. And this is one way to accelerate exponential increase in harvest workers. And that's what you are called to do. You are called to make disciples. You're going to train people. You're going to train trainers. And those disciples are going to train still others. We want an exponential increase of harvest workers during these last days. In such a way, by 2020, we will have reached 700 new villages. That is our goal. And that's just the beginning. Now, the first batch of 12 disciples was sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God in unreached areas in January earlier this year. The first batch of 12 disciples, they were sent out in January. Let me give you the report that I recently received from Subot Jena in India back on May 3rd of this year. He said, our first batch of 12 disciples has planted nine house churches in different villages. Every Sunday, they have nine different fellowships. Our second batch of 12 disciples now has four house churches in different villages. It is so good to see how the Lord is miraculously using them to reach unreached villages with his supernatural power and authority. And these are villagers. These are villagers. Some of them probably never been to Bible school. Maybe some of them never been to high school. But they can read. They can be taught. And they can accept Jesus Christ. And they can be discipled. Okay. You know, we have it so good here in North America, you know. So good, so good, so good. We are spoiled. Okay, and so these workers, which are being sent out, are simply obeying the Lord's command. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. That's what we do. We train harvest workers to obey this command. And when they do this, people will believe and churches will be planted. Now, what kind of churches do they plant? Well, house churches, house churches, house churches. We do not have them build a church building. You know why, right? Once you put up a church building, the advance of the gospel stops because then the pastor's thinking about money, raise funds for the building, uh, how to keep people coming so that we get more and more people and so forth. Then everything is centered in the church, right? And that stops the advance of the gospel. We don't do that. We plant house churches and multiply house churches. 
when a house church grows and uh, it doesn't fit all the people anymore, what do we do? Divide. Plant another house church. House church. House church. That's the way to go in places like India. There's no other way. Besides, in the New Testament, do we see uh, church buildings as we have today in North America? No, they are not there. We need to go back to the model of the New Testament. Now, Luke 10, verse 17, the 70 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So Jesus gave them authority over both physical infirmities and demons when the 70 were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, and so Jesus has commanded us to heal the sick. Is this command still valid today or was it only back then? Is it still valid today? Yes or no? Yes. Jesus has commanded us to heal the sick, not just pray for the sick, and given us the authority and power to do so. So shall we simply pray to God for the sick and after that just sit around waiting for him to act? Is that what we should do? No. But traditionally, that's what the church does. Typically, that's what the church does. Now, before we go on, Examine the following promise just two verses later in Luke 10, verse 19. Okay, same chapter, same context. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. All right? This is for disciples who are sent out. Nothing will harm you. That's a very nice promise, correct? We would like that promise to be fulfilled in our ministries and our personal lives, correct? But in reality, does it always come pass? And the answer would appear to be no. Do you know of servants of God who are going through trial after trial after trial and sickness and infirmities? Yes. So what's the problem here? Let me just share with you the following. Personally, I have seen this fulfilled in my own personal life. All right? I have been to the darkest places on earth. I have been to Benin. That's the birthplace of voodoo. And I was there. I was preaching the gospel. I was challenging the witch doctors. Okay? Just like Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal, I was challenging the witch doctors. I said, hey, all right. Let me see how much power you have. We've got a lot of sick people here who have come to be healed, the blind, the deaf. Come up here and use your black magic to heal them. Show me what you got. Okay? I challenge them. Okay? <laughs> and of course they can't do it. No one ever comes forward. No one ever accepts the challenge. Because they know they can't do it. And after that I say, all right. Now we servants of the Most High, we will call upon the name of our God and ask him to send the fire of healing. Then you will know who is the one true God. Okay? And then after that, <laughs> after that, I call the trained servants of God. The ones I have trained, just like you, I call them. All right, you come to the front, and I want you to prepare to lay hands on these sick people with power and authority. And then I invite the sick people. Well, we do pray. We do pray in the name of Jesus to our Father in heaven, asking him to release his power and authority through his servants to heal the sick as evidence that he is the one true God. After the prayer, then I say, all right, servants of God, come up, stand in a single line, face the people. And then I invite the sick to come forward in Jesus' name, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, whatever. They come forward, the servants of God lay hands on them, and bang, bang, it's like popcorn. People are healed left and right miraculously, and they come up, and they testify before the whole crowd what Jesus did for them. And then, after all the testimonies, I say, okay, who wants to give up idol worship and witchcraft and follow Jesus Christ? And people come streaming to the front, okay? Okay, I have done things like that. Do you think Satan is angry at me? Yes. You think witch doctors are sending curses at me day and night? Yes. yes. I have never felt a thing. Never. Every night I sleep in my hotel like a baby. 
I'm in perfect health. Why? Why has God fulfilled this promise for me? Now, I don't know why, but I'm going to speculate on something, okay? Follow me on this. What is the context of this wonderful promise that nothing will harm you? What is the context? Well, the context is the 72 going out and preaching the gospel and healing sick people and casting demons out of people, right? That's the context. The context is ground level warfare. What they were doing was entirely at ground level. They were foot soldiers. They were preaching the gospel to people. They were healing sick people. They were casting demons out of sick people. It was entirely ground level warfare. That is the context of this promise. And if you mind your own business and simply do what Jesus tells you to do, that is ground level warfare, I believe this promise will come to pass. The immediate context is preaching the gospel to the lost on earth, healing sick people on earth, casting demons out of people on earth, all of which are ground level actions on earth. Therefore, the promise does not necessarily apply when we engage in strategic level spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. I have studied this subject, spiritual warfare, pioneered by Dr. Peter Wagner. And what is strategic level spiritual warfare? Well, this is the kind of warfare where you directly rebuke territorial spirits in Jesus' name. You come against the spirit of come against the prince of Edmonton and you speak directly to him and you command him to leave Edmonton in Jesus name so that people will repent and believe on him that's strategic level spiritual warfare Jesus never taught his disciples to engage in this kind of warfare it is not in the scriptures and if you do you open yourself to attack by those territorial spirits they are very powerful so, uh, I would encourage you to study this matter and uh, take it very seriously. You see, if we obey what Jesus commands us to do, no more, no less, nothing by any means will harm you. But if you go beyond the written word and you start rebuking territorial spirits, you have gone beyond your authority. And when the enemy attacks you, the Lord is not obligated to protect you because you went beyond his command. You see, we are ministering in an area where there is much potential danger. It's the invisible area, in the invisible realm of the supernatural. Okay? Joseph knows this better than anyone else. Okay? Invisible realm, potential danger there. And so you only do what Jesus commands you to do, no more, no less. If you obey him, nothing by any means will harm you. If you want some articles on strategic level spiritual warfare, you click on that link, and I have written several articles. I've looked at this in great detail. So, going back to the 12, they were given this power and authority. The 72 disciples were given this power and authority when they were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God. And so what do we conclude? Whoever is sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God is given a measure of this authority and power over diseases and demons. And who here is sent out as a witness of Jesus Christ? All of you are sent out as witnesses. Therefore, all of you have been given a measure of this power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons as evidence to the lost that Jesus is the Messiah. My job is to teach you how to use this power and authority effectively according to Scripture. Now, let's go to the subject which I mentioned last night at the very end. Why is it that we fail? <laughs> Why do we fail? Why do we minister to the sick with power and authority and nothing happens? Okay, why does often nothing happen when we minister to the sick? Even after we have been taught, laying on of hands, and giving commands based on authority, often nothing will happen. Why? What are we doing wrong? Let's find out. 
Now, often we will blame the sick person for lacking faith, right? Right? You minister to someone you're not healed, well, it's your fault because you lack faith. You have to claim your healing by faith. You have to keep confessing it. And if you're not healed, you lack faith. Okay? Very common teaching within the church, right? Now, did Jesus ever tell infirm people who came to him to simply claim their healing and later they would receive their healing? Did Jesus ever do that? No, never, 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 never. He actually performed the healing. <laughs> so he didn't have to force people to claim it. All right? You get that? And because the church doesn't know how to heal the sick, and so we put the burden of the responsibility on the sick person. Because we don't know how to do it. So you, you claim your healing. And if you're not healed, you lack faith. How do you like that? Now, Let's look at this very well-known scripture. All of us know this. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So we often use these scriptures to show that if you lack faith, you won't be healed. Does that hold? Does that conclusion hold here? That if you lack faith, you won't be healed? Does that hold? No. Even with the lack of faith of the hometown people, Jesus was still able to heal a few sick people. Yeah, he couldn't do the big miracles, but he was still healing a few sick people. So don't use this verse. Don't use this verse to teach that. It doesn't hold water. It's very weak at best. In the Gospels, Jesus never told people that they were not healed because they lacked faith. No, 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 no. He never said that. We will see that Jesus instead emphasized the lack of faith in his disciples when someone they ministered to was not healed. When someone they ministered to was not healed, Jesus did not blame the sick person. He blamed his disciples. And this is an important factor which is not taught in the church today. Because we don't want to make you feel bad. We don't want to blame you and say it's your fault. No. Right? Because if we blame you, you'll be hurt and you won't come to church anymore. Hmm. <laughs> See, that's how it works in the church. You've got to please the people, keep them happy. So they come every Sunday with their offerings. That, I was a pastor for 11 years. You know, I, I know this deal. Oh. You know, although Jesus healed everyone who came to him, the same was not true of his disciples. Now, okay, let's examine the consequence of little faith in the disciple who is ministering the healing. All right? Let's focus on the faith of the disciple, the one who's ministering healing. Christ's disciples did experience failure to heal the sick. Of course, you're familiar with this. It's Matthew 17, when they failed to heal the boy with epilepsy. Verse 14, <clears throat> when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Now, question. Was the father fully expecting the disciples to heal his son? Yes. Very clearly, yes. He brought his son to the disciples. His son was suffering greatly, seizures, convulsions. And the disciples tried to use the power and authority Jesus had given them to heal this boy. And the boy kept on thrashing around, kept on convulsing. The father was so disappointed, and he ran to Jesus, and he tattled on them. Right? That's essentially what this man did. He was so disappointed when the disciples failed to heal his son. Now, this was 2,000 years ago in the Gospels. Let's fast forward to today in the church. 
Do believers today, in the same way, fully expect the Lord's disciples to perform miraculous healings in the church in general? Come on. In the church in general, do believers expect you to perform miraculous healings? Come on, be honest. Be honest. No, 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 no. They don't expect you to, maybe in your fellowship, brother, but in most churches, no. Believers, Christians do not expect disciples to perform miracles. They don't, in general. Am I right? In most churches, yes. So things have changed a lot, right, since then? Since 2,000 years ago, things have changed. Back then, they expected the Lord's disciples to perform miracles. Today, uh-uh, no way. So do you think uh, we're, we're better off or worse off? In this, from this respect, it looks like we're worse off. Okay. Now, how did Jesus feel about their failure to heal the boy? You know, did Jesus say, yes, yes, it's just what I expected. Come on, of course you can't do miracles. Who do you think you are? You're just believers. Only God can do miracles. Only I can do miracles. You, eh, you're just sinners saved by grace through faith. You can't do nothing except cry out to God and trust the results to him. Okay, typically, that's what we would say, right, in the church. What did Jesus say? Jesus answered and said, You faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I stay with you? Can you imagine Jesus, the good shepherd, saying that to his disciples? You know, the Jesus that we hear about on Sunday morning is not this guy, whoever he is. I don't know who this guy is, but the Jesus we hear about on Sunday morning is the Good Shepherd. He's kind and patient and uh, long-suffering and understanding and forgiving, right? That's the Jesus we hear about Sunday morning, right? The, and of course, he is the Good Shepherd. Well, maybe not in your church, sister, but in most churches, okay? So who is this guy? Do you see what Jesus just said to his disciples? He called them unbelieving perverts. In Texas, them's fighting words, you know. I, I pull out my shotgun, you know. I don't take that. Call me an unbelieving pervert. <sighs> Why did he call them unbelieving perverts? Did they commit some terrible sin? Did they worship an idol? Did they commit adultery? No. They failed to heal a boy. They failed to perform a miracle. And Jesus calls them unbelieving perverts. How do you like that? How do you like that? How many times have you failed to perform a miracle? That means you are unbelieving perverts several times over, right? Now, this is the Jesus we serve, correct? So... Now there's some conflict arising in our minds, right? The Jesus we serve is the Good Shepherd. He's our Savior. But he's rebuking his disciples for failing to perform a miracle. How do we understand this? This is kind of weird, right? Are you sure you still want to believe in Jesus? Yes or no? Yes, yes. I will explain this to you, okay? So don't leave Jesus yet. <laughs> Did Jesus fully expect his disciples to heal the boy, yes or no? Yes. Now, is the church today, in the same way, sorely disappointed and complained to Jesus when disciples fail to perform miraculous healings for their loved ones? Let's say, um, let's say there's someone in the community who's sick and they call Joseph. And they say, hey, we have a sick person. Would you please send someone from the church to minister to my sick son? And so Joseph calls one of you, and he sends you to the home to minister healing to the sick boy. And so you go, get in your car, you drive over to the home, you get out, go in, speak to the parents, and then you minister to the boy. And as usual, nothing happens. Are the parents 
Do the parents get so upset when they see that their boy is not healed, when there's no miracle? Do the parents get so upset that they hop in the car and drive over here and confront Joseph? Hey, Joseph, what's going on here? You sent your elders, your deacons to minister healing. My son is still sick. What's going on here, Joseph? Does that happen in the church today? No, no absolutely not. You see how times have changed, for the better or for the worse. <laughs> okay, times have changed, right? Absolutely. Does the church really believe and follow the New Testament as we all say we do? Well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Okay, now, how could Jesus have possibly expected and even demanded his disciples to do the miracle? He seems unreasonable. By today's standards, Jesus was unreasonable, correct? Because only God can do miracles. Who are we? We're just sinners saved by grace. Only God can do miracles. Only Jesus can do miracles. We can do nothing. All we can do is pray to God and leave the results up to Him, right? So Jesus seems completely unreasonable here. This contrasts sharply with our traditions and thinking today. How can we understand the Lord's unreasonable expectations and demand? I'll show you. I'm going to give you three reasons by which we will know that Jesus was completely reasonable when he rebuked his disciples for failing to heal the boy. Reason number one. They were his disciples, and they were being trained to do what they saw him doing time after time after time, right? Jesus would take them with him wherever he went. He would go into a village. He would preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. His disciples observed him, watched him, learning to do what he did. And Jesus was teaching them to do exactly what he did. Correct? That's reason number one. Reason number two. He had given them authority and power to heal the sick and cast out demons. He gave them this supernatural power and authority. All right? Reason number three, he had sent them out and commanded them to heal the sick. And when they failed to heal the boy, they disobeyed his command to heal the sick. Is heal the sick a command? Yes. Is it optional? No. It's a command. That means we have to obey it. And if we fail to obey it, we have disobeyed. Is Jesus happy with disobedience? No. <laughs> Does that make sense? They failed to heal the boy. They disobeyed his command. And he rebukes them. But let's find out why they failed. Bring the boy here to me, Jesus said. Verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. All right, Jesus steps in. He takes care of business. How does he do it? Does he pray to God? No. What does he do? He uses authority. A kingly action. He rebukes the demon. Now, it's the same rebuke. It's the same action that he performed in the synagogue that we studied last night. It's the same rebuke as we see when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of the fever. It's the same verb, rebuke. It's the use of authority. He commanded the demon to leave. It came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Verse 19, this is the interesting question. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Jesus had already given them power and authority over demons and diseases, correct? So they were equipped with supernatural weapons to heal the boy. And so when they failed to heal the boy, they were perplexed. They couldn't understand it. Why couldn't we heal the boy? You gave us this power and authority. We tried to use it. It didn't work. Why couldn't we drive it out? Now, before we look at the answer Jesus gave, we want to look at the four reasons that we give to explain why the sick are not healed 
when we minister to them. Let's say you're ministering to a sick person and they're not healed. How do you explain it? Typically we say it's not God's will, right? And then we might say it's not God's time. God is teaching us to be patient. And then we will say, oh, the sick person has sinned. That's why we're not healed. And finally, this is the favorite. The sick person lacks what? Faith. Okay. Those are the reasons that we give to explain why people are not healed. Now, some of these reasons might apply. I'm not saying they are never, ever valid. Sometimes they might. For example, let's say there is a believer, goes to church, but he hasn't stopped smoking. He doesn't want to repent. He wants to keep smoking. Okay? One day after church, he comes up to you and says, Hey, brother, I can't breathe too well. Would you please lay hands on me and heal me? And you say to that brother, Hey, you're still smoking. You've got to repent of the smoking before God heals you. And he says, Mind your own business. Just lay hands on me and heal me. Do you think God is going to heal that person? No, no, okay? Because he does have sin. So sometimes these things can be valid, okay? Now, however, when we say it's not God's will, not God's time, and that's why the person is not healed, essentially, who are we blaming? We're blaming God, right? Essentially. But what if it's not God's fault? So who do we blame? The sick person. <laughs> How convenient. How convenient, isn't it? When there's no miracle, you always blame someone else. We never blame ourselves, do we? Never, 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 never. We never say, oh, I'm sorry, it's my fault that you're not healed. We never say that. It's ridiculous. Well, it seems ridiculous, right? <laughs> but in this case, whose fault was it that the boy was not healed? disciples fault okay you see we human beings we like to play what's called the blame game okay when something doesn't turn out right we always want to blame someone else okay you always want to point the finger at someone else okay uh, wh where do we get this tendency this disposition we get it from Adam and Eve of course <laughs> remember the Garden of Eden after they ate of the forbidden fruit and God approaches Adam, and what does Adam say? The woman that you gave me. Adam blames both the woman and God. Oh, pretty good. The first human being, yeah, he catches on real fast, okay? And so, and so God turns to Eve and questions her, and what does Eve say? The serpent that for some strange reason you allowed to be in the garden. Okay, that part is not in the scripture. But God did allow the serpent to be in the garden, right? <laughs> and so, Adam and Eve, they, they wouldn't take personal responsibility for their sin. They would blame someone else. Okay? Now, back to this situation. What, Jesus did, what reason did Jesus give in this particular situation to explain why the miracle did not take place? Was it really not God's will, not God's time? Was it because the boy lacked faith? Was it because the father had sinned? Let's find out why the boy was not healed. Verse 20, because you have so little faith. Whose fault was it that the boy was not healed? The disciples, the disciples. Can this apply to us as well? When we are ministering to a sick person and they're not healed, can this apply? Yes, yes. It might be because we have so little faith. Even though we have this power and authority, but if you have little faith, it's not going to work. You see, you need three things if you're going to heal the sick effectively. Number one, authority. Number two, power. And then faith. That's the third ingredient. You have to exercise this authority with faith. And they didn't have this faith, and so they failed. So let's study what kind of faith they lacked, resulting in their failure to heal the boy. What kind of faith? We're going to 
focus on this in great detail. Let's repeat verse 20 again. He replied, because you have so little faith. Now, what kind of faith did they lack? Let's see what Jesus said in the next sentence. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed. Now, notice what Jesus said. He says, you need faith as a mustard seed. He did not say faith as small as a mustard seed, as some Bible versions render it. Faith as small as a mustard seed? No, that is an incorrect translation. Jesus did not want them to have faith as small as a mustard seed. He wanted them to have faith as a mustard seed, with the nature of a mustard seed. The Greek text simply says faith as a mustard seed. Now, Jesus, a mustard seed is very little, correct? Jesus just rebuked them for having little faith, correct? So how could he be saying, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you're doing great? Do you get that? It's a complete contradiction. He just rebuked them for having little faith. So how could he be encouraging them to have faith as small as a mustard seed? No, he's not referring to the size of the mustard seed. He's referring to the nature of the mustard seed. The King James actually has it right. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, not as small as. Okay? So, you don't want faith as small as a mustard seed. Amen? Forget it. You don't want faith as small as a mustard seed. No, 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 no. That will cause you to fail over and over and over. You want faith like a mustard seed with the nature of a mustard seed. And you know the potential in a seed, don't you? Huge potential in every seed. All right. Go back to verse 20 again. Let's start with verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. Now, who is speaking to the mountain here? Is it God? Who is speaking to the mountain? Yes, it's not God. It's you, 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 believer, you, disciple. You will speak to the mountain. You will speak to the demon. You will speak to the disease. You will speak to the infirmity. Move, get out, go. And it will move if you have faith as a mustard seed. And nothing will be impossible for you. And so the reason why we fail is not because we don't have power and authority. We haven't. But we lack faith as a mustard seed. We lack mountain-moving faith. We lack faith that moves mountains. Faith as a mustard seed is equivalent to mountain-moving faith. And so we're going to study mountain-moving faith. That is what they lacked, resulting in their failure to heal the boy. They had authority. They had power. But they lacked mountain-moving faith. So we're going to study this mountain-moving faith. That's why we fail often, because we lack mountain-moving faith. All right. Mountain-moving faith. Verse 21, now verse 21 does not appear in all of the Greek manuscripts, so in some versions of the Bible it does not appear, or it's at the bottom of the page as a footnote. But all of you have read this verse, so we need to look at it and understand it. Verse 21, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Okay. How do we interpret this verse traditionally? You see, they had failed to heal the boy. They couldn't drive the demon out. 
And Jesus said, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. <clears throat> the traditional interpretation is the following. This kind of demon is so powerful that you don't have any hope of driving it out. No, no, forget it. The only thing you can do is fast and pray to God, and God will do it for you. Okay, That's the traditional interpretation of this verse. Correct? Some of you probably have accepted that interpretation. Let me tell you, that interpretation makes no sense at all. All. Okay, take the following scene. Jesus heard that his disciples had failed to heal the boy. He is so disappointed. He is so upset. He rebukes them. You unbelieving perverts, you. How long shall I stay with you? I expected you to be able to perform this miracle. But you know, from the beginning, I knew you couldn't do it. You know, from the beginning, I knew that all you could do would be fast and pray to God, and God would do it for you. Does that make sense? Completely contradictory. Do you see that? That interpretation makes no sense at all. So how do we interpret this verse? I'll tell you how. When you pray and fast, your faith grows. Your mountain-moving faith grows to the point where then you can speak to the mountain with mountain-moving faith. You can speak to the disease. You can speak to the demon. Go with mountain-moving faith because of the prayer and fasting, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. That's the proper interpretation of this verse. So prayer and fasting can be important when it comes to moving mountains, healing the sick, casting out demons. Prayer and fasting prepare you. They prepare you to speak to the disease or the demon. When you pray and fast, your faith grows. Your mountain-moving faith grows. The doubt leaves. And then you speak to the mountain, the disease, the demon, and it will move. Amen? Okay. So you don't want faith as small as a mustard seed. Amen? No, 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 no. You want faith like a mustard seed. You want mountain-moving faith. Okay? So when you're faced with a big mountain, pray and fast first. Pray and fast first. That prepares you to speak directly to the mountain. We conclude that prayer and fasting increase our mountain-moving faith. So that afterwards, we can cast out demons effectively. We can heal the sick effectively. Now, let's go deeper into mountain moving faith. Are you ready to take off like that mountain? <laughs> ready to take off? Let's look at mountain moving faith. We're going to look at Luke chapter 7 where there's a centurion, God-fearing centurion, who has a servant whom he loves, and he was sick and about to die. The centurion is a God-fearing Gentile. He heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Okay? So he heard about Jesus who could heal the sick, and he was a God-fearing Gentile, and so he sent some elders of the Jews to Jesus, asking him to come. Come. Come to my house. Come to my palace. Come to my office and heal my servant face to face. Maybe with the laying on of hands. Okay? And so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. While Jesus was on the way, the centurion had a change of mind. He remembered that he was a Gentile and Jesus was a Jew. And, Je and Jews normally do not associate with Gentiles. And so he wanted to honor Jesus 
And he said, Lord, no, 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 no. I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Don't trouble yourself. You don't have to come. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. Did the centurion ask Jesus to pray for his servant? No. He said, say the word, and my servant will be healed. Hmm. Say what word? Say what? Say what word? You remember the word? We, we studied that last night. Remember? They were amazed at him because his word was with what? Authority. Remember Jesus didn't pray for the demonized man in the synagogue. He didn't pray for him. He spoke a word. Be quiet and come out of him. And the demon obeyed, and they were amazed. Whoa, this man has authority like God. He can give commands to demons, and they obey him. So the centurion said, just say the word. What word? Be healed. <laughs> Something like that. Just give a command, Jesus, and my servant will be healed. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see what kind of understanding this centurion had. I want you to get this. This is the key to understanding authority. Look what the centurion said. Verse 8. I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. Okay. He's in the military. He understands authority. That's how the military operates, correct? This chain of command. Soldiers always obey the commands of their superior officers. That's how the military runs. Authority. That's it. Look what the centurion said. I tell this one, go... And he goes. I told that one, come. And he comes. I say to my servant, do this. And he does it. Did this man have any doubt at all that his men would obey his commands? Any doubt? No doubt whatsoever. Because this man understood the nature of authority. He had no doubt that his men would carry out his orders. Okay, what do we have so far? This man understands authority. And because he does, he has no doubt that when he gives commands to his men, they immediately obey him. He understood exactly the nature of authority and so had no doubt. Now, Look at the reaction of Jesus to those words. And his reaction was highly unusual. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. Jesus was amazed at the centurion. <laughs> Do you want Jesus to be amazed at you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When Jesus heard those words, he was amazed. What words? The words were, I tell that one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I serve my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus was amazed at those words. Why? Because those words signified that the centurion understood authority and had no doubt in his heart. No one else in Israel understood authority. They understood power. You remember the woman with the bleeding? She understood power, right? If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She understood power. But no one in Israel understood authority like this man. And Jesus was amazed. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Huh, how interesting. Because this man understood authority, Jesus said, whoa, he has such great faith. 
I haven't seen anyone in Israel with this kind of faith. Okay, so there's a connection between understanding authority and such great faith. Do you want such great faith? Yes. So what do you need to understand if you want such great faith? Authority. 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 For Jesus, the centurion had such great faith because he understood the nature of authority. And as we shall see in a moment, that faith is mountain-moving faith. And that's the kind of faith the disciples lacked, causing them to feel, to fail, to heal the boy. They lacked mountain-moving faith. And when we fail to heal the sick with power and authority, often it is because we lack mountain-moving faith. If you want mountain-moving faith, you must understand what? Authority. Ah, okay. I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. Now, what kind of great faith did this man have that Jesus did not see even in Israel? Let's specify what kind of faith he had. Well, of course, he had faith that Jesus could heal his servant. That's obvious, right? He believed Jesus could heal his servant. That's very, very clear. But there were other people who came to Jesus, like the women with the bleeding in Mark 5. They also believed that Jesus could heal them. Remember the woman with the bleeding? If I just touch him, I will be healed. Did she have faith that Jesus would heal her? Yes. So it's just like the centurion. He had faith that Jesus would heal his servant. But Jesus said, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. So what was so special about the faith of the centurion that no one else in Israel had? What was so different? There was clearly another dimension to the faith of the centurion that no one else in Israel had. What was that special dimension? Because he understood authority, he knew exactly how Jesus could heal his servant at a distance. He knew how he could do it. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Let me clarify this with a very simple illustration, okay? Let's say Joseph, he's an authority here, right? He's in authority. And let's say he's got people serving under him, under his authority. All right? And one day, Joseph has to go on a mission trip far away overseas. And, and while he's overseas, he remembers that something needs to be done here in church, in Edmonton. All right? So can he pick up his cell phone and call one of you who serve under him? And can he tell you, uh, brother, I would like this done. Uh, please take care of it right away. What would you say to him? Would you say, Joseph, if you were here face to face, I would immediately do what you tell me to do. But you're way over in God knows where. I can't even see you. So forget it, Joseph. I'm not going to do it. Forget it. Is that going to happen? No. 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 Authority is not affected by distance, right? He could be on the moon. It doesn't matter. You would still obey what he tells you to do because he's under your authority, because you are under his authority, correct? Ah, the centurion understood the nature of authority is not affected by distance. Therefore, he knew Jesus could heal his servant at a distance simply by issuing a command at a distance. And of course, his servant would be healed. That's why Jesus was amazed at him. Man, he understands authority. He knows I can heal at a distance. Whoa, there's no one in Israel that has this kind of understanding. And even today in the church, very few people have this understanding. Very few. Yeah, we have faith in God, but we don't have this mountain-moving faith. And how do you get mountain-moving faith? By understanding what? Authority. authority. 
When you understand authority, you have no doubt that those things under your authority must and will submit to your commands. And you can even command them at a distance, and they must and will obey. That's mountain moving faith. It comes from understanding authority. Jesus could simply issue a command at a distance from wherever he was. For example, go! And the infirmity would have to obey and leave. And so the centurion had no doubt that men under his authority would obey his spoken commands. Therefore, he had no doubt that when Jesus issued a command at a distance with authority, with no doubt in his heart, of course, the infirmity would have to obey and the servant would be healed. And that's why he said, Lord, just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. He knew the nature of authority. He knew Jesus had authority over diseases and demons. Therefore, when Jesus issued a command to an infirmity at a distance, of course it would obey because diseases and demons were under his authority. Therefore, of course, he could command them at a distance and they would obey and leave. Is that clear? I hope that's perfectly clear to you. Because the servant understood exactly the nature of authority, Jesus knew that he had great faith. And what happened when Jesus said the word at a distance with authority? The servant was miraculously healed. And so we know that authority is not at all affected by distance. Disciples today can also minister healing at a distance with authority. You can do this too. You can do this too. You can minister healing to people, to infirm people at a distance. We have trained people. They minister to people over the telephone. They give commands over the telephone and people are healed. They do it over Skype. They do it over the internet. People get healed. Because authority is not affected by distance. But did Jesus use a cell phone? No. So you, do you need a cell phone? No. But cell phones are very convenient. You know why? Because you can get instant feedback. <laughs> After you minister to them, then you say, how are you doing? And they'll say, oh, I'm healed. And you go, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. So it's very convenient to use a cell phone, although it's not absolutely necessary. Um, maybe, maybe we can do this in the afternoon. Why don't we do a, a demonstration of healing at a distance? Here. Uh, do you know anyone with a heart condition? Anyone? Do you know someone with a heart condition? Over here? Do you know anyone with heart disease? Uh, later in the afternoon, we are going to minister healing to those people with a heart condition over your cell phones. So I don't want them to come here. They stay wherever they are. But you call them during lunch. You call them and say, hey, this afternoon, I'm going to call you back and I'm going to minister healing to you for your heart condition. So you be ready. All right? Can you do that? Okay. Tell them this afternoon. I don't know exactly when, but it'll be between like, like 3 and 5. Okay, between 3 and 5. You're going to call them from here. And then I'm going to lead you to minister healing to them for their heart condition over the cell phone. And let's see what God does. All right? You want to do that? Okay. If you know someone with a heart condition or maybe breathing problem, call them during lunch. Tell them, I'm going to minister healing to you between 3 and 5 this afternoon. So be ready. And tell them to expect to be healed. Tell them to expect to be healed. If we truly understand authority, we will have no doubt that those things under our authority must and will obey our commands, even at a distance. Are you getting this? You're getting this, right? And when we are preaching the gospel to the lost, guess what? Infirmities and demons are under our authority. Isn't this neat? <laughs> 
Isn't this wonderful? Therefore, we speak to infirmities and demons authoritatively and with no doubt when we are sharing the gospel with the lost. And that's why we fail. Because we always have doubt. You know, when you minister to people, let's say, um, let's say you've never been trained, okay? Let's say last Sunday you came to church, and uh, there was a, and Joseph was preaching the gospel, and there were unbelievers here, and there was a, a sick person up in the front. While Joseph is preaching, the sick person gets up and hobbles forward, and he says, show me the evidence that the gospel is true. So Joseph calls on one of you. He says, stand up, come to the front, heal this person. And you've never been trained to. Okay. When you get up, you walk to the front, what's in your heart? Be honest. Fear and doubt. Exactly. Oh, Jesus, what if nothing happens, Jesus? I'll be so embarrassed. Oh, Jesus, are you with me? Are you here, Lord? Where are you, Jesus? Okay, right? We always go through that, right? That's why we fail. Doubt. Doubt. That is precisely why we fail. Do you get it? We lack faith. We lack mountain-moving faith. We have doubt, and that's why we fail. You want to get rid of that doubt? Yes. Understand what? Authority. Whatever is under your authority must obey you. When you are preaching the gospel to the lost, and there's a person with an infirmity. That infirmity is under your authority. And it must obey your command. You got that? As simple as that. If you understand authority, you can have mountain-moving faith. As the one in charge who has authority, you have no doubt in your heart that those things under your authority must and will submit to you. As the one in charge, you believe that what you say will be done and come to pass. You see, when you're in charge, that means what you say will be done and come to pass. That's what it means when you have authority. As the one who has authority, you will get it done using that authority. You will get it done. You will make sure that what you say will come to pass. You will get it done. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you have a pet dog. He's standing in front of you, and you've got people watching you. <laughs> and you want to show people your authority over the dog. Okay? He's standing in front of you, and you say, sit. It happens, though, that your dog is feeling rebellious at that moment. And so he just kind of, uh, you know, he, does, he doesn't really sit, okay? And you've got people watching you. What do you do? Do you say, help me, Jesus? He's not sitting. Help me. Is that what you do? No. What do you do? You make him sit. Hey, you know who I am. I'm bigger than you. I'm your master. Without me, you're going to starve. I said sit. You sit. You sit. You sit. Ah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? You make him sit. What you say will come to pass. You get it done. You make it come to pass using that authority. That's how you cast out demons. That's how you heal the sick. You make them leave. You force them out using that authority simple as that. That is mountain moving faith. Mark 11.23 I tell you the truth, Jesus said. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. There, mountain-moving faith. How can you have this mountain-moving faith? By understanding what? 
authority. <laughs> That's the key. Understanding authority. If you understand authority, you will have no doubt that when you speak to that disease, that demon, you believe that what you believe in your heart that what you say to that demon and disease will happen because you know it's under your authority and you're going to make it happen. That is mountain moving faith. Comes from understanding authority. The disciples did not have mountain moving faith. They doubted that they could drive out the demon from that boy. You see, when the father brought his boy to the disciples, I'm thinking the following. When, he brought, when the father brought his boy to the disciples, at that moment the demon attacks the boy and he's thrown to the ground and he's thrashing around in front of the disciples and the people. And the disciples go, whoa, this is a big one. <laughs> Glory to God. Jesus, this one's for you, Lord. Where are you? Come down from the mountain a bit faster, Lord. This one's for you. See? Doubt. 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 They didn't understand authority. Therefore, when sharing the gospel, you have no doubt. That when you issue commands to infirmities and demons, what you say will come to pass. Because you understand your authority over them. That is mountain moving faith. Or faith without a doubt. So who has mountain moving faith now? Yes, you all have mountain moving faith. Because you understand authority given to you by Jesus Christ. To go out, to preach the gospel, and heal the sick and it will be done for you God will do it for you but you do your part which is speak with no doubt with mountain moving faith and God will do it for you but you do your part often we don't do our part we don't have mountain moving faith we don't command with mountain moving faith we command with doubt but when we do command with mountain moving faith and no doubt, the Lord will do it for us. The mountain will move. Now, we can understand the basis for our traditional way of ministering healing, which often involves, and this is what we looked at last night, these are the traditional ways that the church has of ministering to the sick. Okay, Prayer to God and then leaving the results up to Him. And often, when we're ministering to the sick, we will say, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Even before they're healed, we will say, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Uh, often, when we're ministering to the sick, we, we will go into the prophetic mode. I proclaim healing over you. I speak healing over you. I declare healing over you. We often do that. And many of us will speak in tongues when we minister to the sick. Speaking in tongues, of course, is a priestly action. And many of us, we also do the following. We say, Father, in Jesus' name, I rebuke this infirmity and command healing. We mix the priestly and the kingly, okay? This is what we looked at last night, the traditional ways of ministering to the sick. Now, in light of what we just studied about mountain-moving faith, let's evaluate these traditional ways of ministering to the sick. Let's look at the first one. Prayer to God and leaving the results up to Him. When you do that, 